Hello, everybody, and it is wonderful to be talking to Robert Allen Owen, aka Squid Rugby, today on the Scrum because we're going to be reviewing essentially how we got things wrong on our fantasy league, uh, both myself and Robbie. But, Robbie, before we get going, welcome to the show. It is brilliant to have someone of your genius in terms of rugby reviewing and thought processes because before we get into exactly how squid rugby came but how are you sir i'm i'm very well i'm very well i'm very flattered mostly uh over build as well i think um and robbie just i think for all the viewers if they haven't heard of squid rugby i'm not quite sure under which stone they have been hiding or living the past what five six years um but give us a brief understanding of where squid rugby came about obviously you also potentially started under a stone but you have risen to rugby review folklore um and legendary status given your technical nuance and analysis post big games small games rugby world cup six nations where did it all start for 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 robert allen owen (laughs) <laughs> thank you yeah um under a very small stone as you say and it's now just a slightly bigger stone um i'm still staying under that stone i still don't want to see too much sunlight as you can probably tell <laughs> um yeah i i think i always wondered why no one was doing it for rugby you know why there was that kind of there wasn't anyone doing that kind of like both detailed analysis type stuff that you know i've kind of taught myself that there was really detailed analysis but there wasn't anything that was perhaps um consumable i guess you know, um, so you kind of had stuff aimed at people that had like level four coaching certificates and then you had pe- stuff aimed at, you know, the the real casuals and you didn't have anything in between. And I always wonder why that wasn't there. Um, and then I kind of, I was doing a lot of other projects. I was doing sort of stand up that was going okay. And I was doing other, you know, sort of creative projects that weren't going anywhere in particular. Uh, then I wrote a couple of pieces for a rugby blog um, that, you know, I knew someone that um, ran it. Um, and they went down quite well and I slowly started to have this idea while I was working at, you know, another job that I really, I worked for, um, I don't know if I named the company, but you know, a big delivery company and I am not a man made heavy lifting if anyone's seen me. Um, and so, you know, I really was not having a great time and I kind of had the idea percolate in my head for squid rugby for this kind of YouTube, uh, rugby thing. And so I made a first video, I made a second video, and thankfully the two of them went down quite well. And here we are today. Somehow I've just kind of snowballed to whichever rock I'm under now. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're under rock. I think you are now moving boulders, uh, Squid Drake, in terms of how you didn't. I mean, you've had coaches from around the world praise your various types of analysis done post-games. I think, um, not that he's the most infamous at the moment, but even Rusty Rasmus has said that, you know, Squid Drake, you know, potentially has some some really cool insights yeah that was bizarre that was surreal um having that tweet suddenly appear from from razzy being tagged in it um that was one of the most surreal moments of my life because i kind of as i say i kind of make them in this little bubble you know i made most of them in my kitchen because it was the only place i had desk space in my old flat um and so you then kind of go like oh and then the guy that actually won the world cup the world cup winning coach probably the guy that if you're to go off it knows the most about rugby in the world if we're to go kind of a metric there well, we uh, won't tell eddie jones that right. eh? we won't tell eddie eddie jones what <laughs> no no i hope he isn't listening oh brilliant and i think obviously we are in the autumn nation series we have had two weekends but last weekend was the real slate of full games that we got to see and it has almost been two years since we've seen the northern and southern hemisphere teams come together up north um there were obviously a lot of one-sided games only two of the you know the seven games were actually won by the away side being the number one and two side in the world in south africa and new zealand um but your thoughts on a new branded competition with games being able to be viewed not overlapping each other, but literally at separate times. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's been fantastic. Uh, and as I say, I think the way it's been laid out so that there is always a game on, you know, the the moment from about half 12 onwards until about 10 o'clock at night, there's always rugby on and high intensity and high quality rugby as well. You know, it's not, you're not having to dip into a bit of curry cup in between watching two internationals. Like it's it's properly great, intense stuff the whole way. And I think every game had stuff to to dig into and to really enjoy. Um, 
that you would have looked at before this weekend, perhaps Italy, New Zealand, as being, it's going to be a bit of a blowout, but Italy were really competitive and very, very good uh, throughout pretty much the entire game. You know, they had that kind of classic New Zealand soul splinter at the end, um, but otherwise they were fantastic. Uh, Italy, Ireland was more one-sided than we thought it was going to be. No, sorry, um, Ireland, Japan was more one-sided than, yeah. Ireland, Japan was more one-sided than we thought it was going to be, but that itself was interesting because we weren't expecting Ireland to run away with it in the way we were. Um, so yeah, I think it was a fantastic weekend and I'm really enjoying everything so far. And I was fortunate enough to be at the Principality back with crowds for the first time in over 19 months. And it was, for me, a proper test match. I think it had elements of everything in it. You know, Welsh side, we were coming off a rather disappointing record loss against the, the All Blacks a week before. But your quick thoughts on the Wales Springboks game uh, last year? Yeah, weekend? I thought it was fantastic. It's such a high quality, such an intense game, just the whole way through. Um, I think it really showed what a good team the South Africa side are. The fact that so much of what they do was cancelled out. Like I thought Wales kicked better. Um, I thought, you know, they kind of stopped them at the mall up until the moment where they didn't. Um and they cancelled out pretty much everything but the scrum for most of the running time. And yet South Africa came through and won. Yet the Springboks came through and won. And that is the sign of a really good t- side. It's not only a team that wins when they're perhaps not playing at the best, but a team that wins when the opposition has done absolutely everything they can to try and you know take them on and take them down. And they still doesn't happen. They still come through. Uh, and I think it was really encouraging for Wales. Um, it'd be nice if we'd won, perhaps, uh, to slip into being partisan for a moment as a Welsh person. Um, but I think there's a lot that both sides can take from it. Um, I think it's about, it's one of those really great, really high-end wet weather games, you know, where there's not perhaps the running rugby you'd look for, um, but there's everything else. But it's it's so fast-paced and high-quality and intense. And there was only perhaps one unforced error by Tane Basham. Like, the rest of the game pretty much was was as you'd hope, you know, um, in terms of as good as it could be, given the weather and given the conditions. I, Apart from perhaps, you know, the, the actual Malcolm Marks try, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a really yeah. compelling game. Yeah, I, I did too. I think it really had, you know, those various different elements of Test Match Rugby. There was a great ebb and flow in the game. And I think, you know, Wales, um, and one's got to mention Ellis Jenkins, I think he was phenomenal throughout, I think, to come, you know, from the rugby wilderness, you know, of the three-year layoff. Credit there to the Welsh forwards earlier on, being able to deal with that more. But look at this body position. Absolutely strong over the ball. Fantastic work from Ellis Jenkins. Um, and put in a performance like that, I think you know, South Africa were, were lucky that we won it because you know Franz Stein then became man of the match. But I think if Wales were to have won it, you know, we would, I definitely think we would have seen Ellis Jenkins being given been given that mantle. So, and for Wales, it actually doesn't get like sort of easier. They've got running rugby Fiji, um, who are going to hopefully be displaying what we saw in the last two weeks of last year's Autumn Nations Cup. But they finish off their Autumn Nations series against Australia. Um, so taking on the big three of the Southern Hemisphere isn't going to be an easy task, particularly looking ahead to the injuries they've got, but hopefully some youngsters that have been putting their hands up. Mm, yeah, I mean, I desperately, as a as a Wales fan, hate the Fiji game. It is the worst game because we, it's always a struggle. Uh, it's always awful. They're kind of our big bogey team. You, know, you go back to 2007 and being knocked out of the World Cup. Uh, you look at two years ago in the World Cup, Wales were behind early on, uh, and it kind of took a Josh Adams hat trick to, to pull them out of it. Um, mm. So I do wonder if if it was any other sort of tier two nation, Wales might experiment a bit more. I wonder if they might go Fiji are not only this big bogey team for us, but they're also in our World Cup pool. So Wayne Pivak said before the autumn that he's looking at Australia and Fiji as the two big games really because they're the two teams in our pool at the World Cup. Um, so they're games where you can perhaps afford to experiment slightly less than usual. Um, and so... That's going to be interesting. Yeah, there are a few young players. Uh, you've got Chris December, who has been playing for Exeter, hasn't played a lot, uh, but is a very good sort of player from everything we've seen, played very well from the twenties this year. Uh, and then Ben Carter, who won his first cap in the second row as well this summer, uh, came off the bench for one minute against the Springboks, so you didn't get to see much of him. Um, but he's very good. He's got that kind of... Uh, he's often being compared to a young Alan Wynne jones which is a lot to hype on any player. Um so yeah, you're like, you know, the, the most cut player of all time, but younger. Um but there's to say he's only just finished his first season of professional rugby, 
Uh, he's an extremely good young second row, and I'd quite like to see him get some proper game time for Wales again. Yeah, I think it's again that you know it almost feels like there needs to be a change in guard. And Sam Warburton actually said pre-match uh, that Wales actually need to start developing leaders because if he, you know, with the likes of Ken Owens out, Alwyn Jones out, um, you know, these guys out, yes, Dan Bigger can can step in, but you know, where is the next leadership group coming for? If you know, if John Davis is is out, you know, where does that next group actually come from? And the likes of an Ellis Jenkins, um, you know, is coming in and, and putting his hand up, which I think is great. And just one minute means a test cap. So I don't think Mr. Parker is going to be complaining that he got one minute, uh, Robbie Allen, because that means that there's a, a little a little asterisk now next to his name that he has actually stepped onto the field for the Wilds. <laughs> yeah. um, and looking ahead to the last weekend of, last two weekends of the Autumn Nation series, obviously, I mean, we've had some, already had some really big games, but it doesn't get any more exciting. You know, you look at the, the France, New Zealand game, um, you know, South Africa, England to, to finish it off, you know, Wales, Australia, it, it really does feel that it's great to have rugby back, but it's great to have high class international rugby where, you know, you actually don't know who to call, which I think is, we haven't had in a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. Virtually every game is difficult to call. Again, you look at games like uh, Ireland, Japan this weekend, there was a chance going into that Japan could have won it. It ended up being a blowout in the other direction. Um, that aside from a couple of the All Blacks fixtures, virtually every game looks like it can go either way. Um, Scotland could win all four, you know? It could have been easily they came out of it three losses. It now looks like they could possibly win all four if they can beat South Africa this weekend, uh, which I don't think is impossible at all. You don't necessarily know who's going to win that going into it. Uh, as you say, Wales Australia is always a back and forth. Um, you've got France New Zealand coming up at the end as well, which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited about that I have been ever since I saw it existed you know just every night I go to bed dreaming of that game um, so it's not got anything to live up to <laughs> and we have Aaron Smith coming up against Anton Dupont uh, in, in that yes. last game which uh, he's just, just been recalled which I think again two of the best nines I think the world of rugby has ever seen and what a challenge it will be for you know 24 year old Dupont coming up against the experience when I mean, he's got 107 test caps now uh, Aaron Smith so I mean that would you know that's yeah. a battle that get every rugby supporter's mouth watering and we haven't seen them play against each other that's been the thing about covid is it's meant that they've only played the kind of teams geographically close to them so it's the first time we've seen a lot of these teams play each other since the world cup or even further back than that um so it's really exciting to see these matchups and see you know players like um andrew kellaway and so on haven't played against other than you know spell up northampton i guess but haven't played against northern hemisphere teams but has been really establishing himself over the last year or so uh, again, you've got players who have now got sort of 10, 15 caps for their country who are coming up against the Southern Hemisphere teams or the Northern Hemisphere teams for the first time. Uh, yeah. And just seeing that kind of clash of styles and that real difference in what they're they're being tasked with is really exciting to watch and really interesting to watch. And as you say, having DuPont and Smith against each other finally. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that and I mean, just, just the French, you know, scrum off, fly off, centre axis that mm. they got going, that exuberance of youth against the, the likes of the old head of a Bowden Barrett and the Aaron Smith. You know, it really just makes the rugby enthralling. You potentially have Marcus Smith who could come up against the Springboks and you know, bring a different dynamic in under the tutelage of, of Owen Farrell. We're not quite sure if Eddie's ready to like just throw him out and let him be Marcus Smith. So it's going to be interesting to see how the next two weeks' worth of selection going. Um, just in terms of England, I think just your overall take of where England rugby is, obviously a push showing in the Six Nations. You know, Eddie has spoken about resting a few players in this two-year period cycle between now and the next World Cup. You know, where where are England currently, in in your opinion? Yeah, it's an interesting one, because they did this four years ago. You know, after the Lions tour, uh, they had a few players, including the likes of Tom Curry and so on, who went on to become, you know, major parts of that World Cup final effort. Uh, And also they had players like Henry Slade and so on, who'd won a handful of caps that really, really kicked on and became, you know, first... 23 players um, and they start to kind of find their feet from there I think he's been even more extreme this time and he's picked even more players uh, but that's because you know a lot of the squad that he's been playing for eight years are now starting to get you know to a point in which they're they're getting slightly older um, and I think they've started to unearth some players in like Freddie Stewart at fullback I think is exceptional uh, I think he's been very good for Leicester every week and I think him he's really taken to international rugby very quickly Um admit that he's only played against Tier 2 teams so far, but I'm really excited to see him play. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of team, lot of players, rather, who are going to make 
up that team that plays the next World Cup um, that are going to be winning their first sort of four or five caps here. And they're starting to change their attack up. Again, we haven't seen it against a sort of world-class defence. Um, so I'm interested to see how they, they go about that because A. Jones has talked about wanting to increase the speed they play with and increase change the way that they play because he feels it's the game starts to go towards being more attack-based after being quite kicking-based for the last couple of years. Um, so I think England are at this point in transition and they're more naked about it than a lot of other teams who are kind of trying to hide their transition as Ireland and Wales both have been doing. Um, and Australia as well have kind of done it quite well. Uh, they're kind of hiding their transition, whereas England are being quite naked about it going this autumn is to get us to a place in which we can possibly compete with the next Six Nations and then long-term the World Cup beyond that being the ultimate yeah. goal. Brilliant. And then just to finish off, and I do want to quickly chat about the Autumn Nation Series Fantasy League. Um, mm. I think I came in at number 4,200 and odd. I would really thought I'd gone with all the right picks. Um, I had a late change in bringing Will Skelton in because I got informed via social media, thank goodness for social media, that Bernard LaRue was injured and wouldn't be playing. So he was my man on the bench. Um, so brought in Will Skelton. Um, I actually thought I'd got it right. Uh, and I just don't know how I'm so far down the line. Your <laughs> fantasy league teams at the moment, how are they looking? Where did you actually end up in weekend one? Yeah, I'm about 440th out of about 600 in the league, I think. So not that great. Um, I've got this awful habit in fantasy leagues of picking niche players from sort of, you know, going like, oh, that's Namibia's best player, and I think he'll do pretty well. And then it not quite paying off, you know, in terms of if you just picked a couple of All Blacks. Uh, so I've got an awful habit for that. Um, I think I did try and counter that and stack my team of All Blacks, and then perhaps they didn't score as many points as we thought they might, uh, and left out, only picked one Irish player, you know, in Tyburn. Um, so perhaps didn't net some points there uh you know we'll, we'll we'll build on this we'll learn from this you know it's a long yeah, autumn it's definitely. a long autumn i can no. make it 400 and I think places. what people don't understand for those of, of that haven't actually watched or got onto the the fantasy league you can only pick three from every team so it's not like you got like and you've only got a certain number of allocation points that you can sort of use so it's not like you can pick all the all blacks or you can pick anyone and i think that's what makes the fantasy league really good is because you actually have to think a little bit in terms of that but on thinking and on your analysis on your rise to stardom in terms of how people get into you know squid rugby and understanding your thorough analysis that really makes it easy to understand the game have any international coaches put your email in the inbox to ask you to join the technical analysis side of a international rugby team at moment uh, <laughs> I haven't had any formal job offers. Um, I had one from an, a US uh, university team uh, offered, and I it was a lot. Um, I didn't. Uh, I did have one premiership coach quite recently uh, DM me and say you should be coaching, um, which I was flattered by. Um, I'm not sure about it myself, but I was I was enormously flattered. Uh, um, not yet not yet let's go with not yet so perfect so for those of you watching this week's episode of the scrum you've heard it here first Robert Allen Owen is available he hasn't received any formal job offers so for those that want expert analysis of every angle of the game this man is your guy Robbie Squidge Rugby Owen it was absolute pleasure talking to you thank you for your openness your transparency thank you for bringing the game to the fans in a way in which they understand, making it easy, but also giving a technical nuance that uh, many professionals you know, really enjoy. So long may you continue rolling the boulders down the hill. I don't think you are under a <laughs> rock anymore. Um, but thank you very much for joining us on this weekend's episode of The Scrum. And we look forward to getting online, getting on your YouTube channels, your social media channels of Instagram and Twitter, and just seeing how expertly you make sure that rugby comes across to everyone so thank you very much for your time sir thank you thank you no i really appreciate that's very very lovely of you to say thank you no thank you for thinking me thank you for having me